Everybody and welcome back to the ATI podcast. Barrett here, Josh back in the saddle as well. And we are happy to have a very special guest on the show, Mr. Ryan Reed. How are you doing, Ryan? Doing awesome. Happy to be here. Glad to talk to you guys. Yeah. Welcome. Welcome. Thanks for your time today, man. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I know that it's a little bit more grueling for you, Ryan, because you just disclosed to us you almost had a 14-hour drive uh, mm-hmm. prior to getting set up for doing this. You're out on a fishing competition out there on the East Coast, right? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, it's going to be a long weekend, but it's fun either way. Yeah, absolutely. So what's it looking like? You got practice? Like, do you guys get to practice and you're doing like a two-day and then a weigh-in at the end of both days? Or So uh, I'll get practice tomorrow. Um, yeah. I'll- all day. I got to be at check-in. Um, everybody has to go to check-in, uh, use measuring boards in kayak tournaments. So you got to go get your board checked by the bass officials. Uh, I think that's at like five tomorrow. Uh, once that's over, you can go home, do whatever you want. And fishing starts on Saturday morning at 7 a.m. After day one, you just get off the water, go do whatever you want, go home or, uh, you know, go out drinking, whatever you want to do. Yeah. And then day two, same thing, 7 a.m. fishing. Get off the water at probably 3, I think is what uh, off time is. And then straight to the check-ins. So with kayaks, you, they call it a weigh-in, but it's not really a weigh-in because you don't bring any fish with you. All okay. the fish are automatically released. So you I got catch you. them, you take a picture of them on your board that you measure with, and then you release them. So they call it CPR. Okay. Um, catch photo cool. release. Uh, so it really leads to like a 99% survival of a fish that's caught rather than right, a fish that's yeah. caught, put into a boat, travel, you know, however many miles, and then maybe it lives, maybe it doesn't. So better for yeah, the species. Survival. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But can let them get bigger too, man. Like some of them fish, you know, they, they get older, they get way bigger. So it's right. cool to see them get back and right. handled like that. You know what I mean? Taking care of them. Yeah. Especially when you t- start talking about smallmouth. Uh, smallmouth oh, take yeah. like 15 years to get big. And, right. Uh, and so like there in Missouri, smallmouth is a huge thing. So people kind of take it for granted. Uh, but then you get down to like, say, Texas. And I think the Carolinas have some smallmouth. Um, and and people are just way more cautious about it because they realize how special they are because they don't have right. it as much. So Yeah, but, we're very fortunate here in Missouri. Like we don't realize just how many natural resources are at our fingertips and uh we kind of take it for granted you know Absolutely. and that that's definitely in part like why this is such a pleasure to have this discussion on this particular episode we've had an outdoors episode previously uh with a gentleman that used to live in this area he is actually doing like some crazy hikes out on the west coast uh mm-hmm. in california and he's done like stuff at yosemite and I, whatever that trail is that interconnects everything up through the West Coast, through the various mountains. Yeah, I can't He's think of what that's that called. As well. I mean, he just had some crazy stories. but I know on the other side, it's the Appalachia Trail or whatever. And yeah. that, that what it's called. The, I don't know what it's yeah. called on the West Coast. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, we grew up in, in enjoying the outdoors. So, again, you know, that's kind of how I knew, knew you. And it's a pleasure that yeah. I get the experience sometimes on the show to interview friends of the past, friends of old. Uh, whenever I see them doing very successful things, I like to bring a, a an interesting things. I like to bring them back on the show and shine a spotlight on them. And I felt like you fit that MO for sure. And uh, I'm just fascinated with various things that you post about, which we'll get into the weeds on. Uh, but I've been quite the I've become quite the kayaker in some senses personally. So I always enjoy seeing the fact that you're implementing kayaks and your fishing uh, in particular. But you've always been a fisher. I mean, even when we were kids, you would be out there on the shores 
the muddy shores of Lake Killarney. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, <laughs> back in the glory days. Doing your best to uh, to fish in the the turd pond water out yeah. there. <laughs> they're trying, like it's like they're they're so cyclical out there at that lake. I was, I was just there in Ironton. Uh, what was that two weeks ago? And it actually looks pretty good. They've got it pretty clean right now. The water looks really good. We get like it. two years, and then it'll be gone <laughs> again. I think so. they drained it, didn't they? Yeah, within the last couple yeah. of years, they did drain and clean it yeah. pretty yeah. extensively. So, but they, they seem to do that about every five years because they do it, and then they don't keep up with it, and then it goes right. to shit again. And right. then, they like, have to oh, how do we do this again? So Drastically, yeah, go yeah. through drastic measures. But, <laughs> but the, I fix, mean, I, the biggest fix of that, and I think that they're just ignorant to it, is that they can work with Missouri Conservation – and they will like right. give them grant money to take care of the lake, but right. then they have to open it up for public fishing, right. and they won't right. do that. Right. right? Yeah. I live in Teradalac, and it's a very similar situation. Like yep. they have sixteen lakes, but it's hard for them to manage all those lakes because of how small of a crew they have right. and the limited funding, which yep. is mind blowing to me because I pay seven hundred dollars a year in dues for yeah, one. Yeah, but mile. you pay your dues. Some yeah. people don't. Yeah, some people don't pay their dues. <laughs> anyway. Regardless, yeah, there's 16 lakes out there, oh, yeah. and, and it's hard, it's hard for them to manage them all, but yeah. they won't refuse the, what, the Department of Conservation or Natural Resources in because of exactly what you're saying. It has to be open to the public. Right. Yeah. Right. So, yeah, which is, I mean, which is just bad. Honestly, it's bad all around. It's bad for the residents. Like, absolutely. Don't get me wrong. It's nice to have a, a private area, but what's it worth being private if it, if it just goes to hell and, and right. you can't even enjoy it? Because Look at Killarney, what it was before they did this again. You couldn't put your boat on there. There was no way right. to motor. It was just, yeah. everything was just bound up in weeds. Right. Yeah. So, well, it, it's funny that you bring that up because I was going to make this point whenever we were kids and we would always go out to go swimming out there in the summer. And, uh, I mean, we could we could swim out maybe about 70 yards and stand up because of how bad the brush and stuff was piled up and accum accumulated inside yeah. that lake. And, wow. uh, I mean, even up until I think maybe the last time I swam in it was in my early twenties. So we're talking like, you know, 15 years ago now, <laughs> but, uh, it's hard to think it's been that long, but, but yeah, it was pretty much in the same state of affairs, if not worse, but we were pretty brave back then. Cause uh, you would oh, see yeah. some, you'd see snakes pretty briefly, oh, routinely hey. out there and shit. No, too, no, yeah. no. Well, they had, the, that, the they had that swimming dock there. Right. And I don't know if you remember, I think it was Andrew, um, that tried to jump off of your guys' trampoline and it slid off of the dock. Oh yeah, that's <laughs> right. I forgot about that. Cracked his back on it. Yeah. Oh, oh man. Man. <laughs> Yeah, we did some freaking sketchy shit back in the oh, day. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. That's what we that's what Killarney was good for. We had one of those little Pilates trampolines, and uh, oh, we shit. took it down to the lake with us because we were like, "Oh, we can do sweet moves off of this thing." <laughs> and Ryan and Andrew were a little bit better, at, like the flips and that type of stuff, because I was always like the tall, awkward one. But, yeah, I do remember now, Andrew, we've got a good run, and he'd run down the dock, mm -hmm. and he tried to jump on that son of a bitch, and it just slid. <laughs> and he, just, he slid, bam, back down the dock. Damn. He was just, he was, oh. he was in bad shape. Yeah. He was trying not to sell it, but, man, it was oh, rough. Man. It was yeah. a rough time. Yeah. But, good yeah, time, I, I know, like, man, that's just some of my favorite memories to reflect on and stuff. Cause you know, now that I have kids, they'll ask me questions about dad, whenever you were a kid, what'd you do? Blah, blah, blah. And a lot of the stories start out with me and Aaron had these friends that were also <laughs> brothers across the road yeah. and we would do this, play basketball, play baseball, go swimming. <laughs> you know, we did it all play video games. Paintball. Uh, you made it, yeah. Paintballing, <laughs> uh, had wrestling matches and oh, yeah. Would they would start out kind of fake and fun, but somebody ultimately would piss off somebody else, and <laughs> yeah. something egregious yeah. would happen. Oh yeah, uh, you get a real yeah. DDT. <laughs> yeah, for real. a real pile driver. <laughs> yeah, I think it was. Uh, I think it was Aaron. I picked up one time. We were all horse horsing around on the basement, and his feet hit. We had that real low basement ceiling mm -hmm. with the HVAC running across there, and it scared me because his feet hit the the sheet metal. And it had a lot of boom, and I dropped him straight on top of his head. Oh, yeah. shit. And it, it was rough, man. Like, we did some wild-ass shit, breaking oh, windows yeah. and shit, climbing up on the roofs of abandoned houses. Like, Oh, oh yeah. I, I, like, I, I sometimes think about, like, what the how, – how, why were we doing these things, and why <laughs> were we allowed parents? to get away with it? Yeah. <laughs> Where were the parents well, at? 
<laughs> yeah, really. That's that. That is often the question. Like, yeah, what what, what were our parents doing? No, uh, I was but, just telling my my mom like maybe a, a month ago. So remember, we had that pool in our backyard. Yeah, yeah. And I told her, I was like, "Did we ever tell you about the time we jumped off the roof into the pool?" She's like, "No, you did what?" And I was like, "Oh yeah." <laughs> so you guys were gone. We just climbed up on the roof and jumped. She's like, it was yeah. like four feet deep. And I was like, it's all good. We lived. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we made it. We're still here to yeah. tell you about it. <laughs> <laughs> that was the kind of yeah. stupid things that we did back then. Oh, man, the, the bad hill, too. Like, that that thing should have done one of us in at some point, and it never did, thankfully. But yeah. we had that huge hill that mm-hmm. we would go, uh, well, eventually snowboarding down. But yeah. we would take our sleds up there and go up to nearly the damn top of this hill. Yeah. And it was probably a good hundred yards, just a straight, you know, forty-five oh, yeah. big old turkey almost, holler, almost straight up. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And uh, if you went down that thing in the sled, there was a ditch, and then there was Highway seventy-two. Yeah. Oh shit! And we yeah. would pop that ditch sometimes, and almost get up on the highway. Oh yeah, down, that's, down that thing. And that's a sketchy little area yeah. down in there on seventy-two too. Yeah. Do you so remember when Andrew more. wrecked his bike doing that? Yeah. Yeah, I do. <laughs> Yeah, he <laughs> fucked himself up. Andrew, it seemed like, fucked himself up more than everybody else. He, he did. He did. Yeah. He was a little bit more da- like daredevilish, I think. Danger yeah. Aaron kind yeah. of guy. Yeah. Back then, he was pretty dangerous, yeah. Yeah, he was kind of the first guy to, like, be okay with doing some shit. And I'd be like, yeah. that's fine, I'll watch you. Yeah. <laughs> I'll, I'll hang back. I'll, I'll see you. how yeah. it goes. Yeah. I'll wait at the bottom. <laughs> uh, Butch's... Well, we think it's Butch's because it was Butch's signs, but one time Butch's gas station down there got rid of their old uh, Conoco signs. They were like those um, those plastic, like yeah. old brittle ones. Like if they get sun faded, they just crack. <clears throat> Some, somebody dumped them off in the ditch down there on 72, like near our houses. And we actually used those as sleds one year. And we got the bright <laughs> idea to try and snowboard on them. Oh, as well. God. Stand up on yeah. them. They were like, I was, I, pretty sure they were about like five or six feet long they were pretty big <laughs> um but they didn't last long we tore the hell out of them <laughs> so that being said we've laid the foundation here that we were always kind of outdoors guys yeah, uh absolutely. back in the day even and, and that's, that's what the parents said go outside don't come back right, yeah. till it's dark uh, yeah basically that's pretty much yeah. part of our culture around here too I yeah mean, you kind of bred into that that culture yeah a lot sure. of people are Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I, I mean, it helps having all these nice natural areas and state right. parks and, and things like that as well. You know, you can't beat it. Uh, you know, I thought for the longest time when I was younger, it's like, when the hell am I going to get out of this hell hole? But I've went to other places and you like start to realize what you have at your fingertips, just natural resource wise here in Missouri and how beautiful it is. And, you know, all the various seasons that you get to experience for good and for bad, you know, I, it, they don't get that at other places. And no. you don't realize that until you've been out of the state for some period of time right yeah yeah i've lived a lot of places and uh i've always told everybody i'm going back to missouri and they're like why i'm like it's just it's just awesome man i don't know how to tell you it's just awesome yeah man. can't beat the cost of living either yeah no. just, uh, <laughs> that's the big thing yeah. yeah not at all so i know like as we were kids and stuff obviously you know people graduate high school they drift apart a little bit i know there was a few occasions we'd message each other over social media and things like that. So I know you had a, a bit of a stint in the military, the Air Force, right? Yep. Yeah, I was the Air Force. How many years did you serve there? Uh, so I had six active, and then you have like two where it's, they call it inactive reserves, where you yeah. don't do anything, but like, should we go to World War Three? They're like, well, we might just recall you, so just hang out. But yeah. they, don't, they don't ever need you, you know? Yeah, so, right. Right. You were there yeah. just in case shit pops yeah. off. Right. <laughs> yeah. What was your occupation in the Air Force? Uh, so it's called tactical aircraft maintenance. Uh, you're basically a glorified uh, gas pumper. Um, you do a lot of maintenance. Like, you know, you, you do fix a lot of stuff, but it's like I said, it's pretty, pretty glorified work. Um, we worked on, I, I worked on A-10s and U-2s. So for people that don't know what those are, the A-10 is an attack plane that's designed for low combat, um, mostly for combat search and rescue kind of missions um, and ground support. <clears throat> and then I also worked on a U-2, which is for reconnaissance. So high altitude, up in the altitude, like 70,000 feet. So, Yeah, that's awesome, man. 
Yeah. Day ten. That now that's is that what they call the warthog or whatever? Yeah. It's got the the burp gun yeah, on that's it. That's the warthog. It's got the the thirty <laughs> millimeter Gatling gun. Yeah, that's insane, man. That's cool. Yeah. Oh, our friend Brandon is also in the military. He's in the Air Force and he's trying to retire military. He's got several years in now. I want to yeah. say like thirteen or Gosh, so. Yeah. It. It's been a long that's time. Too. Yeah. So that's so, about that's about what I would have been at if I would have stayed in because I got in in twenty ten. Yeah, that's the same year he went. Yeah. He went in April. Yeah. I think it was April of twenty ten. Yeah, he's yeah. on the so, law side of it, the legal side, right? Yeah, now he is. He he's was changed MP. occupation several yeah. times. He started as an NP, then he uh, switched mm-hmm. over to investigator. And then that, now he's a paralegal, and yeah. uh, he seems to like that quite a bit. Yeah, yeah, I'm so, sure that's a lot better because MP is like oh, the yeah. worst job you can have for the military. Yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, I think he didn't like his dad was a cop, and his dad served in the service, like the reserves or something, and um, so he just he felt like that was familiar, I think, and so he started yeah. with that. Uh, but yeah. then, you know, as he was in there and realized it was kind of the shit job, and all the dickheads kind of work it in the military. <laughs> it is. Uh, there is a lot of dickheads in the MPs, but there's also a lot of good people. I mean, you know, sure. like I said, I, I did six years. I did, um, what was it? Two of that was overseas and four of that was stateside. So I met a lot. I got restationed a lot more than I wanted to, honestly. But, um, yeah, I met a lot of MPs. I was friends with a lot of MPs. I was MP enemies with a few MPs. And so sure. you, know, you get a few, a little bit of both, but there, there's definitely some dickheads and they get pretty cocky. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've heard that. I know at one point you were stationed in South Korea, right? Twice, yep. That was twice. Like two years was both in Korea. Once I, I went over there right as I joined the military, and then I went again uh, three years later. So how was how was South Korean life yeah, as man, a military that's, member? That's a place I would like to go, actually, South so, Korea and then I mean, Tokyo, too. As, as an Air Force guy, dude, it's cake. It's so much – it's so fun. Um you get to see a lot more, um, and the, the Air Force guys are really spoiled because we have Osan Air Base, which was where I was stationed, where you have all the luxuries. You got fast food, you got a Chili's, you know, you got nice oh, wow. dormitories. Uh, I had my own my own room and everything. I didn't have to share a room with anybody. And so for nice. Air Force, it, it's cake. It, it really is. Um, and we, we had a lot more time free to go out and do stuff. So... My first tour, um, I was there. We were considered more like training, and we're there. We do like on call, or you work twelve hour shifts, you know, seven days a week sometimes. Yeah. The second time I went back, I didn't. I was actually uh, considered uh, real time, and we were there doing reconnaissance, and so we didn't have to play all the funny games. We were there. I only worked fifteen days a month. And the rest of that, I was able to, able to travel and, and see the country. So it was a blast. I got That's to see cool. a lot. Wow. And, and, and back in those days, man, I, I partied pretty hard. I'm not, I, yeah. I went hard. So, <laughs> went in Rome, right? Right. Yeah, yeah exactly. And then, you do all the dumb stuff that, you know, all the dumb military guys always say, oh, I got so drunk. I don't even remember, like, a week. And, like, you just do stupid yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, what were some of the cooler things that you had the opportunity to do over in South Korea that maybe most people wouldn't even have on the radar? Um, so if you go to South Korea, anybody can go and see the demilitarized zone. And I think a lot of people know about that. And it is really, really cool. Um, what they don't know is you can actually go down inside of these tunnels that were dug by the North Koreans trying to invade South Korea. Oh, oh, wow. Wow. Yeah. Dude. So you, they actually take you down into the tunnels and you can see across to where the North Koreans were like trying to cut in. Oh, wow. That's crazy. That would be pretty wild. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So, um, wow. It, it was pretty, it's pretty surreal to go out and see that kind of stuff because, you know, that was like sure. a real war. There was a lot of people that died in that. Um, yeah. Yeah. My grandfather it, was in the <laughs> Korean conflict. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And my grandpa learned more. So it's it's cool to go out and see that. Um, but honestly, one of the more rewarding things was there's actually a lot of um, foreigners that go there to teach English because English is such a, um, I don't know what the word would be for it, but everybody wants to know English over there. Sure, so, right. Because they all know that you got to have English to be business because all business ends up going through America at some point these days. Sure. So they all teach English. And so if you didn't know this, 
Susie Spitzmiller was in Korea at the same time I was. I did know that she went over to Korea, but I didn't line up the timelines or anything. Yeah, her and I were th- was there at the same time. Uh, we actually hung out a few times. She showed me some of the, like, the backside of Korea that you can't see as a, as a military person because they don't like the military over there. So she was yeah. able to take me because she was a teacher and show me the like, actual backside of it where it's, it's Korea, but it's not tainted by the, the Westernisms. Right. Gotcha. And yeah, that gentrified so, out. And whatever. Yeah. So right. if, if you're able to get out there and actually see that side of Korea, it's totally different than the Americanized side of it where there's McDonald's and, and Apple stores and all that stuff. But to yeah. see the actual side of Korea where the people are there and doing their own culture, it's, it's really cool. Yeah. That would I, be neat. I'm a big fan of South Korean films. So I, I like a lot of uh, directors that come out of there. Like Park Chan-wook is one of my favorite directors and he's from South Korea. Yeah. The guy who did old boy. And, uh, gotcha. yeah. So, but yeah, I, I would love to visit there someday. I'm not, not probably in my top five, but it might be in my top 10. Oh, it's definitely up there for me in my top five, South yeah. Korea, Japan. I would love, I like, I have an affinity for that kind of culture. I don't know. don't know why I've always been into it, but yeah. and I'm not even like an anime guy or anything like that. I just, uh, I don't know. There's something about the culture. Yeah, they I have a lot of culture sh- culture over there. If you want to go over the, and and really submerse in the culture, I mean, they have all the historical things, just like going to museums around here. But they have like the old old cities that are there. So, yeah, right, that have been there for so long, right? Yeah, historical centuries. Yeah, yeah. Did you have much of an opportunity to like travel outside of Korea while you were there? Um, you know, South Korea in particular. No, and I, I've talked about that before with people. Is like the hard thing with being, uh, I'll say, a younger person in the military is that yeah. you end up having all these family obligations that you know you'd love to go and and travel because it's so easy for you to jump over and go to Australia, to the Philippines, to Thailand, um, yeah, anywhere in, in Asia. But you know, every time you get a break, which when you're overseas, you only get about one break per year. Um, realistically, and it's usually for about a month stretch. Yeah. And most of, most of us just get guilted into saying, "Oh, my family wants me to come home and see them." So, right. sure. catch a plane back to home. You spend a whole right. month sitting bored at your parents' house, and then you go back to work. <laughs> I mean, and, and and that was what ended up. I ended up doing it both times I was there. Um, you know, you can't say you regret it because you know family is important, but. You also like, sure. man, I really missed the chance to really see some cool things while I was at that side of the country. Yeah. Yeah. Japan would have been one that would have been real easy to go over and visit for sure, too. Oh, yeah. yeah. And for Japan sure. is a country that's always fascinated me as well. That's probably up there for me. Um, I did get to go to England um, separately. Uh, it wasn't okay. while I was part of my Korean tours. Um, I got sent over there on, uh, they call it temporary duty station, um, when I was working U2s out of California. And I, I did get to go over there and spend, we were there for a week. And England is actually super cool to see. I mean, we went and saw like the London Eye, Big Ben, um, Stonehenge. Awesome. We did all that touristy crap. Yeah. But uh, it's yeah. cool to see it. It's cool to actually just put your eyes on it and like sure. be physically in the moment, you know. Yeah, yeah. I could imagine England's another area I'd really like to visit. Yeah, as absolutely. Well. So, but I had uh, to shoot a game of golf while I was there, so that was a lot of fun. <laughs> yeah, you can't yeah, go to England and not play golf. Yeah. yeah. Hey, uh, I wanted to ask you too. You know, once you got out of the military, uh, what was life like for you? Were you having issues trying to figure out what you wanted to do with your life? Um, you know, career wise, or just kind of talk to me what what the state of the affairs were for you once you're out of the military? I'd say I was more of a mixed bag. Um, so when I was Station in California, which was my last duty station before I left active duty. Um, I was actually volunteering with a parks department out there doing um, baseball coaching, basketball coaching, and just kind of helping them out wherever they needed it. And I just fell in love with it. It was so cool to be engaged with the community and seeing the the children kind of grow up um, in doing that. And I was pretty close to Sacramento. We were actually kind of in the outskirts. I don't, I wouldn't call it like the hood area of Sacramento, but it was pretty <laughs> rough. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and so it was really cool to get engaged with these kids that, 
you know, didn't have a lot of the opportunities, you know, that, that I did growing up. And I saw that and I was like, this is the coolest shit I've ever seen in my life. I'm leaving the military and this is what I'm going to do. Yeah. So I, I got out. I went back to college um, down in Branson at College of the Ozarks. There you mm-hmm. go. Uh, got a recreation degree. And people laugh at that. They're like, what the hell is a recreation degree? <laughs> I'm like, I went to school to have fun. Like, that's all it was. Like, I went to school to learn how to play sports. Every sport you can imagine, we studied it. You know? Yeah. And and obviously, you got to do the boring stuff, like the history of it and all that. But um, sure. And so I got a degree in, in recreation with a, a business minor in that. Um, and there, there were definitely times, um, and for people who don't know that might be listening, College of the Ozarks can be a trying place for a lot of people to deal with because they have a lot of restrictions. Um, and being a 20, you know, late 20 year old in college there with mostly 18 to 22 year olds was very challenging. And yeah. so I was like, I had days where I was like, this sucks. Like, I just get out, go back to the Air Force, do my 20, and retire. Uh, but obviously, I stuck it out. I didn't ever go back. Yeah. And um, right out of college, I got a job working in recreation. And I did that for, I think I was right at four years before I quit and became a stay-at-home dad. So, Well, that's that's a good reason to quit, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, It absolutely. wasn't an easy decision, I'll tell you that. People think that it's like, yeah. you know, sunshine and shit. Like, oh, yeah, you don't work. You yeah. just stay home and take care of your kid. I'm like, <laughs> dude, I wish it was that. Like, right. right. My kid's only right at 18 months. Actually, today's his 18 month birthday, whatever you want to call well, it. Well, happy so. birthday. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so, uh, you know. you're, you, that one's not too far from my youngest right now, Ava. She's, uh, she just turned one in February. So, yeah. 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 It's, man, it's a handful. And it's a lot of fun, but it's, it's challenging every it day. Is. Like, you don't oh, have sure. many good days. You have good moments, but you don't yeah. have many good days. Yeah. Right. For sure. Yeah. So, yeah. And I don't know, like, I guess, you know, I was, you know, I, like we're saying, we're kind of raised in like the old fashioned way. It's like you're raised to like be a man and take care of your family. And sure. And to like stop doing that was not like an easy decision for me. It was really hard yeah. for me to like walk away from working. Kind of went against everything that was ingrained in you yeah. early on. Yeah. Yeah. And I would say that is kind of quote unquote unusual. Uh, in our area, but there are those who do it. Josh is a stay at home yeah, dad. I'm a stay at home dad right yeah. now, so I feel you, man. It's tough. It's, it's, uh, I have, uh, several children, so it's like I have a baseball team in my house all the time. So <laughs> it's, it's yeah. chaos 24 7. It's all boys. All boys beating the hell out of each other. Yeah. Um, I mean, you've never, <laughs> you've never seen a toilet so covered in piss in your life, man. It's insane. <laughs> So I get. If you think you I have, he'll send you some pictures. Yeah. Oh no, <laughs> I'm telling you, you have not seen one like mine. No, mine still just pisses on the floor if he doesn't have a diaper on. <laughs> yeah. Like I tell myself pretty routinely, like I'd like to be a stay-at-home dad, but then like whenever I take a few days off of work and I'm like, oh, I'll do something fun, keep keep the kid home from daycare, do this, do that, and just like the end of the day, I'm like, I need a break. Yeah. Know? Yeah. And that's just it's like, exhausting. Oh yeah. Yeah, no. it's mentally exhausting. No, I understand for sure, yeah. man. Yeah, I, I can remember first starting it. So the hard part with us starting it was, so my wife is a, is a travel nurse. So she's like, hey, I want you to quit, and we're just going to travel. And I was like, all right, cool. Like, I'll quit, and then we'll kind of, like, stay home for a little while, and, like, I'll kind of get a hang of this. She's like, nah. We went straight into the camper, like, two weeks after I quit, and we've been living in a camper ever since. Damn, and yeah. so it's like transitioning to like living in an RV and figuring out how to raise a kid that's like yeah getting into everything. Right. It's like every day is a learning curve for me. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. I can imagine. Oh, man. Yeah, my you wife is also a nurse. So. Oh, no. Oh, you no, can't. no, there's no <laughs> way. Yeah. <laughs> no, uh, I had to live in the camper. Pam and I lived in the camper briefly toward the beginning of our relationship. And um you know, that was just two early 20 year olds living inside of a camper together. And it was kind of driving me mad. I could just imagine trying to have a family inside of one. Yeah. 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 The worst part, hands down, is that your bathroom doors don't close. At least ours don't. Right. It's yeah. a sliding door and you can't yeah. lock it or anything. 
So right. if, if I'm no away privacy. from him, he's like, what he's do you do, there. Dad? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Just give me oh, a minute, goodness. kid. Yeah. <laughs> I just need 20 minutes to sit on my butt on here and look right, at my yeah. phone, flip exactly. some videos. Yeah. Yeah, I hear you. I'll give yeah, you any cartoon you want. Just leave me alone. <laughs> right, right. Our youngest daughter, she's uh, really fascinated with bathroom doors right now. Well, doors in general, but Open specifically the bathroom door. Yeah. 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 Just standing there, opening and closing them over and over yeah. and over. She just is yeah. fixated with it for whatever reason. On top of the thousand kids, we have two giant German shepherds that are really smart, too. And we have the, yeah. the handles where, you know, they're like elongated. Yeah. The and they open like this. You know what I mean? And they, they know how to open, open the open. doors. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> the cats do that. Yeah. It's crazy. Man. So camper life. Um, now I know that you've done some things to, you know, keep yourself busy outside of that. And that's kind of in part the discussion today. And that's kind of start a social media presence and uh, with your outdoor reels, fishing, kayaking, that stuff. What kind of, where did the inception of that idea come for you, Ryan, to start doing that stuff? Uh, honestly, it wasn't even an idea. I was just fishing, having a good time. I've been doing fishing tournaments since I, uh, since 2017. Um, just kind of on the side as it worked for me. I love, I just love fishing. Um, and so the kayaks actually, um, Andrew gave me my, lent me my first kayak. He had this little piece of shit, yellow banana hammock <laughs> lifetime kayak. And he's like, yeah. Hey man, like you want something to do for the summer? Right after I got out of the air force, here's a kayak. Yeah. I, I don't got any better to do. Sure. So I started kayaking back in 2016 doing that and just fell in love with it right there. And, and I just, I've been doing it ever since. And then, uh, it's probably two years ago, just over maybe, um, I was never really very engaged or active on social media, but I had social media kind of like everybody else did. And me and another guy, his name is Brandon Heimrichs. Uh, he's actually in the army. He's a helicopter pilot. Uh, he lives there, um, right outside of Ozark where, uh, we were living. And we connected on social media. He's like, hey, man, I like to fish, too. You want to get together? Cool. Like, sure. And so we got together. And he's like, oh, yeah. He's like, I like taking pictures. And, like, I'm doing social media. And I was like, oh, that, that's cool. Like, you do you. Like, I'm just here to have a good time and fish, man. Right. So we would go out. And he would take pictures. And he'd send them to me. And I'd be like, well, I got these pictures. I might as well post them. So then every time we'd fish, I'd post some pictures. And it just kind of evolved from there to where we have trips now where we're like, Hey, like we got to go out and shoot some content and right. you know, we'll, we'll focus. Like we kind of not let it like consume an outing, but we'll right. spend like a dedicated 30 minutes trying to like just video. Cause people like to see that raw stuff. Like they don't always want to see the really pretty every time right. you caught a fish, they kind of just want to see people on the water doing these things. And so we'll just video the other guy just cruising around on his kayak doing his thing. Yeah. And uh, we'll just take turns every once in a while. And then we'll just be like, all right, like we, we took quite a bit of raw footage. Now let's go fishing. And, and uh, hey, if you catch a video or a picture of it, then awesome. But um, we, we try to not let it take away from the fishing aspect of it. For sure. I know like two, well, actually funny enough, I kind of got into kayaking about the same time, about 2016, I started kayaking. My brother-in-law had some kayaks and they bought some private uh, land down near Rolla. Uh, they kind of live like Salem, Rolla, Rolla-ish area. And uh, they own access to both the Little Piney and the Big Piney River. And there's a spring that uh, feeds apart where they meet. And they actually have like, a, it's like they own this old well house and shit that's down oh, there. Shit. It's wild, dude. Nice. I would like to know how old it is because it's crazy. They've got like these weird, like blown glass that somebody stuck in the side of some of the walls oh, and stuff. Yeah, that's cool. <laughs> like handmade stuff. Yeah, yeah. It, it's ancient, but this is just like a little like river access for them and their family because awesome. they own all this property down there. What a sweet and, little uh, piece of property to have. Yeah. yeah. My first experience getting on a kayak because they had both sit in and sit on top styles, of course. And I was like, I'm not really sure which would be right for me. I'm a pretty good swimmer, but I don't know that my balance is that great right now. So I tried both. 
but I was trying to put in right where the rivers met, which was a bad idea to begin with, as it was being inexperienced. So I didn't really know how to handle myself. So I started to get turned around. And in my in my trying to fight around, fight myself from getting turned around, I flipped my kayak over uh, on several occasions. <laughs> we understand. It didn't time. go that well. So <laughs> then I just got, like, the uh, the non quitter inside of me was just like, I got to do this until I can do it. And eventually I did before we left that day. And then I just like was obsessed after that. Like yeah. I had to have my own kayak, you know, do it at my leisure, that sort of stuff. So, and they're crazy now, these kayaks that they're oh, making, yeah. like these homies, oh, yeah. they have like the paddle kayaks. And like, I seen one the other day that you can put a freaking DeWalt battery on it. And it's like, I guess like a screwdriver mm. and you can yeah. squeeze the trigger and it propels you. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I was yeah. like, that's pretty wild. You can recharge the DeWalt battery and, and it's just the, crazy. The cool thing is that you can get as advanced or beginner as you want in a kayak. There's, there's every yeah. level you can imagine. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And especially at first I didn't, I mean, I guess I should have assumed that that was the case, but you know, you just, you know what you know. Right. right? So right. like around here, access to kayaks, even though being the area that it is, was actually kind of limited at the time, even then, but I've noticed like inventories of, skyrocketed since like even walmart of all places yeah they keep has like 50 plus kayaks on hand yeah basically from spring to fall now and uh you know the quality of said kayaks and variety has increased pretty you know recently over time as well even places like tractor supply has kayaks in stock now right you know in these areas which honestly is smart because we get a lot of tourism down here in southeast missouri a lot of people going to, you know, do the Jack's Fork thing or the float trips or whatever the case is. And they're they're weekenders, but also at the same time, it starts to become a passion and they'll buy their own kayaks and then try to go to other places. Yeah, and they'll frequent spots. Yeah. Right. Mm-hmm. But, uh, you know, I, I got a pretty decent little Pelican kayak. Um, the fishing aspect of it, though, is something I wanted to get into with you, Ryan, because I've never been a very good fisherman. I really didn't have the patience for it, even whenever we were younger. Uh, if I didn't, you know... And it would be pretty common, like me and you and Andrew or me and Andrew would be out fishing and he'd catch three fish and I wouldn't catch shit. And we'd be staying at 10 part, 10 feet from each other, <laughs> you know, and I would just get so impatient about, oh, I can't catch no fucking fish. Let's go. I'm going to go shoot the basketball now, you know, yeah. or something, you know, Some, <laughs> yeah, something that I can. I just didn't have the patience for yeah. it. Um, yeah. But, you know, Josh is more so the fisherman than I am. So he can probably speak in on a lot of that stuff more so than I can. But uh I, I will say that I can tell you that I know this, and that is, uh, obviously, you have to have good balance to be able to do that while you're kayaking. Oh, as well, yeah. I give it to you. The kayak, kayak is. I give it to the kayak fisherman, man. That's that's like doing three things at once. <laughs> yeah. And on top of that, you know, whatever the water conditions is, the swiftness of the current and, and those sorts of things. So, yeah. um, you know, initially, whenever you started kayaking, was immediately fishing a part of that? Or did you get the kayaking down and then started doing a little fishing? Like, yeah, it was what kind straight of to the fishing. fishing. It was it was yeah. straight to the fishing. Um, obviously, like you said, we we grew up fishing, so I had fishing poles at home. Um, I got that uh, kayak from from Andrew. I took two little ultralight spinner reels, went down to uh, Thompson Ford outside of Fredericktown, and that's where I started right there at Thompson Ford. A uh, great little spot to drop in, do some fishing. Uh, it's pretty minimal current, and yeah. just the smallest baits you can imagine just having no idea what i was doing just those little rebel cross you go to walmart oh yeah and, yeah those are and, great and cheap too <laughs> yeah and, and that was what what i used and that was all i knew um and then slowly like anybody else I started going to youtube looking up what to catch fish on and right it, it really just evolved from there and i and i really did fight kind of the the growth of fishing for myself at first yeah, I was just so closed minded. I was like, I'm going to fish with an ultralight and I'm going to fish with these little crappy lures because like it's working. And why would I want to make it complicated? You know, right. I'd go out there with this little bitty tackle box and two little poles. And that was it. And it was simple and it was easy and it was relaxing. And I'd always take yeah. a case of beer with me. Yeah. yeah. Well, and catching, uh, catching anything on ultralight is a blast, man. Even even a a pound or a two pound fish on ultralight is a a blast to catch. You can catch that all day (laughs) and have a good time. So I get that for sure. Yeah. That's what I, I fly rod fish sometimes, but mostly we do like the winter catch and release trout fishing. I'll use an ultralight. Yeah. That's what I prefer. So I do a little bit of fly fishing. I don't, I'm not 
a great fly fisherman by any means. I'm terrible. Um, and I've never caught a trout on a fly <laughs> rod, but I do a lot of smallmouth fishing with a fly rod, and that's a lot of fun. Yeah. I have heard a lot of people doing that. Like, um, they have a Joe Ackham run up here. Like, uh, it starts up in DeSoto. Like, there's a Joe Ackham Creek access, and that's like a trophy smallmouth rehabilitation area. And there's yeah. several guys that fly fish up there for smallmouth, so that's cool. Mm. Yeah. Can you imagine catching, like, a four-pound smallie on, on a fly rod, man? It's, They're a river species. It's crazy. It's nuts. The biggest I've ever caught was, like, a, probably a pound and a half smallmouth. So, and it drug me all over the place because you're right. on a fly rod. So, you have minimal control over what he's doing. Right. Just much. There's such a wild species, such a, you know, yeah. like a river, river, you know, born and bred fish that's just, oh, yeah. they're just wild yeah. and more hog wild than a, like a large mouth, so to say. Oh yeah. I, I would imagine with the kayak fishing as well, there was probably like a lot of trial and error at first because, you know, you'd said you were kind of closed minded at first on how you wanted to approach things and it was just being, you know, done with fun as well, but I'm sure things like advanced past those stages, obviously compared to where you are today, like what, what were some of those milestones would you say that you realized like, Oh, there's more to this than what I'm doing. Uh, so for me, uh, let's see. So I had that little crappy kayak and then I got to college and I was like, okay, like I really want to take fishing more serious. So I went and bought my own fishing kayak from Bass Pro Shops is an Ascend Sit Inside FS10. Like I'm here to, I'm, I'm going to get serious about fishing. This is a good time. And I started fishing out on Bull Shoals anytime I wasn't in school. And so I would go from there, um, from school straight out, go fishing, and I was just getting my ass kicked. I didn't know what the hell was going on because it wasn't a river. It wasn't easy. Yeah. Right. And, uh, I remember coming back to the dock one day and this old man's like, Oh man, did you catch him today? And I was like, uh, no, what about you? And he's like, Oh yeah, we got like 30 fish today. I was like, um, Jeez. how do you catch these fish? Yeah. Like, what and are you so doing? He, he told me, he's like, Oh, you gotta throw a Ned rig. And so a lot of people these days know what a Ned rig is. But back then it was kind of like a, a newer bait. And I was like, just show me what it is. And he's like, oh, it's just like this little hook with this, like, little crappy worm on it, like a half of a worm. And I was like, okay, that's simple enough. And so I went and I bought some of these hooks and I started cutting worms in half and I just started catching the hell out of fish. And I was like, okay, this is a lot of fun to, like, learn new things. Yeah. And, and from there, it was just like, okay, what can I learn next? And so I, I learned a little bit more and then I was, learned a little bit more. And then I was like, okay, now it's like time for me to challenge myself and start trying to do tournaments. So then I did my first tournament in 2017 with the uh, Moyak Fishing Club. Uh, first tournament was on Stockton Lake, if I remember correctly. And just crappy rain, windy, uh, but just conditions. caught the hell out of fish. We just ripped them up. And I couldn't even tell you what place I finished, but I'm sure it was crap. But I had so much fun that I was like, okay, this is like the coolest thing ever. Like, I'm going to fish tournaments for the rest of my life now. Yeah. And, uh, and it's just from there, you know, it took me a little bit more to get fully dedicated to it because of finishing college and everything and uh, sure. working through the summers. But then as soon as I finished college, like I was, I don't think I've missed a, a season since i always running almost every single event in the season. And it's just, it's a blast, man. And that was really the turning moment. I think for me in tournament fishing was that, that one tournament that was just the crappiest you could imagine, but just had so many fish catch that it was just, it changed my, changed my life with tournament fishing. For anybody that's not familiar with it, what does a tournament season look like a typical tournament season? Uh, so in Missouri, um, every state is different, um, especially in the South. Like, they'll run tournament season almost all year long, take like maybe a two-month break. But in Missouri, we just kicked off um, the the first official event was the Taney 20. Um, that was two, it was like, I don't know, March 1st, I think is what it or April 1st, I think is what it was. It was like right at two weeks ago. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and that was the first event of the year. So it typically starts right around the beginning of April. 
And the last event will actually not be until typically October-ish time frame. Um, there will be a tournament every single month for the, for the local trails. And then there's also river trails that run kind of side by side. So they'll make them offset to where they'll never interfere with a, a, tr a regular lake tournament. So that you can have the opportunity to fish both. And I mean, local trails are usually pretty simple. Uh, it's typically people that if you don't know already, then they're super friendly, willing to talk to you, teach you kind of the ropes. And it's really treated as a community. And that's kind of like the thing that draws more people, I think, into kayak fishing sure. is the community over what people call the glitter boat world which is, you know, the actual Bassmasters, the FLW, BFL, right. yeah. all the, the really big tournaments. Because a lot of those tournament guys are really kind of kept close. They don't want to talk about what's going yeah. on. They, they're just I there to kind of like win. Yeah. Whereas yeah. Like the kayak world is way more friendly. Everybody wants to kind of just hang out, drink beer together, and catch a bunch of fish. And so the community aspect of it is really what grew the sport to where it is now, which is it's really kind of catching up in the world to where, you know, Bassmaster is running a series. Um, you have the Hobie Bass Open series also. There's the KBF, which um, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole different wormhole to get into right now. But, um, but specifically the Bass and the Hobie series is growing and and when I talk about the growing aspect, I talk about the the media and the advertisements. So it opens yeah. a lot more doors for the people that want to do it seriously, but still want that community because a lot of the kayak guys still treat it as a community. And you get out on the water and everybody wants to be friends and talk, and, and it's still a lot of fun. But there's a lot yeah. more money in it now. Yeah, well, you are seeing a, some of those professional anglers too jump and ship. Like, I, there's one that I follow who's one of my favorites, Mike Iaconelli, and he's been yeah. a glitter boat fisherman like for a long time. He's won the classic twenty years. Yeah, yeah. Um, now he's doing kayak tournaments, and he's yeah. you know, and he's one of them. He's he's kind of like you, you know, in the sense that he's one of those ones that will actually get on the screen and talk to people and tell people or you know give people advice and stuff right. like that. Right. So, yeah, yeah, it's cool to see. It's cool to see. Yeah. You know. That has drawn some of those guys over to it too. Yeah, they're definitely making uh, making the, the slow conversion for some of them. Um, so, like very specifically, uh, we fished Gunnersville, Alabama, maybe a month and a half ago, and uh, Greg De Palma is a Bass Elite Series fisherman. Came fished the event, won the event with like his second day ever in a kayak. <laughs> oh my god yeah <laughs> he's like oh this is like my second third day on a kayak and uh you know i'm just kind of winging it and i'm like yeah. well yeah like you're winging on a kayak but you know you know what you're doing like right. come on yeah right. them guys are so knowledgeable so, about it they live yeah. and breathe it man yeah but, absolutely so obviously you know fishing in a kayak is different than fishing out of a bass boat and he he alluded to that too he's like you know like this is different definitely different he's like I know how to catch fish, but he's like, it's a lot harder in a kayak um, than a boat. And the biggest thing is, is in a boat, you can start out at one point on the lake, but you can run the entire lake in one day. Right. You can't do that in a kayak. If you drop in a kayak, you're pretty committed to one area for that day. And, uh, and so it honestly teaches you a lot. It teaches you a lot about patience, thoroughness, and just kind of milking everything for what it's worth. And, and that's one of the right. things that, that he was talking about too. So and it, that's where yeah. it is. It's, it's a growing thing. Um, kind of like what Barry was saying is like, it takes a lot of patience. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, not everybody's got that patience, but there's also the fun aspect of it where you and your buddies jump on a river, take a case of beer and like yeah. one fishing pole and you go float black river and catch a hundred fish in a day. Oh yeah. You get smashed while you're doing it. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Black Black River is obviously, you know, one of those things I think a lot of people take for granted because they've just grown up around it. But yeah, it is a really fun river to fish, to kayak, to float, you know. Beautiful. Outside yeah. of just going and doing the Cambridge thing. I mean, it has a lot of other opportunities. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's beautiful. 
uh, whenever you started doing your digital content and stuff, like actually focusing in on it, has, has the strategy changed over time outside of, uh, I know that you said that people like the raw footage aspect, but I think I've also seen you doing some things like unboxing and talking about specific baits and, and outdoor wear and things like that too. Yeah. So, I mean, it changes, I guess, as much as you want to see it change. Um, the big thing is kind of like what anybody that messes with social media understands is that you have an algorithm that you're going to have to appease. If you want to have any success on social media, then you have to understand some aspect of the algorithm, um, whether that be with TikTok, YouTube, um, Instagram, which is where I'm biggest at, is that they're only going to push certain content that fits certain criteria. So when I first started doing content, it was all about pictures. They didn't care about anything except for pictures. Yeah. So you, you take a bunch of pictures and then you, you know, you post them and you don't have to say much because it's just a picture. You just say, Hey, this is something right. that we did. Like, cool. And then it, it kind of grew to Instagram was competing with TikTok with short form videos. So they said, hey, you know, if you post videos in short form, we'll really push them and, and draw people to your page. So, you know, obviously, if you want to grow, then that's what you do. And at that point, I was trying to grow. So I started doing that. Found a lot of success doing that. And um, I've just been riding that wave ever since. And then um, with the growth of the channel became the, the income of people that come and say, hey, like we want you to work with us and promote our product, um, which is where it leads to, you gotta do unboxings, you gotta talk about the product that you're giving. Yeah. Um, and, and people come to you and they say, hey, we'll just give you something if you'll just talk about it. And I'm like, okay, like I'm gonna use it anyways, M might as well get it sure. for free, you know? Sure. Hell yeah, right. Um, and, and the hard part about that is that you see a lot of the the newer guys that are trying to get into it is that they'll take stuff that they don't believe in. It'll talk about it sure. and it just discredits them right off the bat. And then they sure. just, their page is just done for as soon as they, as soon as people catch on that, they're just making it up just, just because they got free stuff. Um, right. It's going to, it's going to kill their page. Um, and that's kind of been one thing that I've kind of leaned on was just, I've been brutally honest um, about every product I've ever touched. Um, and I've, I've gone out and I've bashed hard on products and then, right. I've, and I've if actually a had the, turd, the polished turd. You got to call yeah. it a polished turd, man. I've eaten crow. Like I've had to, I've had to retract statements before and be like, Hey, like I, this is what I said. Um, you know, this is kind of what I learned in, in the process and, you know, I was wrong, you know? Yeah. And, and that's one thing that I think people respect is the fact that you can have, a, a really bad experience, but then turn around and have a positive experience. As long as yeah. you're willing to admit it and, and talk about it, people love to see yeah. that stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I've gained sponsorships from it. And so it's, it's one of those things that if you're an honest person on, on social media, people want to listen to you. Uh, when it came to, you know, some of the products that you've done the unboxing stuff for, I know like recently it's not just limited to let's say a reel in particular, but I know there was some like outdoor wear type stuff too. Um, that you did. Was there anything that you got the opportunity to do either an endorsement or unboxing thing that maybe initially you wouldn't, it wouldn't have been on your radar, but because you had that opportunity to promote the product and you actually use it, it was very beneficial to you. Um, I, I guess the best way to say that is like by like literally like right here, like what I'm wearing right now, hook, yeah. hook gear. Um, I would have never in a million years thought that a company like that would approach me and just like, Hey, like we want to work with you. Um, we love your stuff and like, let's do something. And I was like, like, is this a prank? Like, is this a scam right now? Sure. And, uh, obviously it, it turned out to be a real thing. Um, the people there are awesome. And, and it, it's one of those things that you just don't think is something you're going to get from doing Instagram pictures, you know? Right. Yeah. Right. And you get involved with these like huge brands that I don't know, I guess as a, I guess you could say as a consumer, you, you go to a Bass Pro or a Academy Sports and you see product on the shelf and you're like, okay, well, this shirt's the same as this shirt. Like, why wouldn't I yeah. just take the cheaper shirt? Right. And then you actually work with the companies and you're like, 
well, I wouldn't buy that cheaper shirt no matter what, because like this stuff is better. The people are good. Right. Um, and you actually get to know the people that are involved in it. And, and that's kind of been the coolest part is getting to know like the back scenes of some of these bigger, um, bigger companies. Yeah, I can imagine. And, um, you know, it's, it's funny because fishing is one of those things, much like drumming, uh, I can speak to on a personal experience. Like when you get the opportunity to work with companies and actually use their products, I mean, that's the best application too. Um, you know, sometimes, like you said, you kind of do the window shopping thing and price intimidates you or whatever the case is. But more times than not, like, especially when it comes to goods like that, if the, the higher the price, the more quality work in, yeah, you're paying you know, went for into what you it. Get, you know what I right. mean? Right. Yeah. Absolutely. So, and the hard part about that is that there are companies out there that are purely knockoffs, which, right. you know, it's, you know, it is what it is. You right. make a great product. There's going to be a company that's going to come in and knock you off for a tenth of the price. You know, Absolutely. Look at, look at Yeti. You know, same thing. Yeah. Right. Um, but there's still that aspect of that. I'll call it brand loyalty. The kind of it's kind of a word that I kind of stick to, and I'm talking to any kind of companies these days. Is it don't matter what your price is if you're putting out really good product, even if the next guy right next to you is the exact same product almost. You know, you're going to have that brand loyalty because the people believe in you. They like what you do. Yeah. They, you know, and, and people have a good there. experience. They want to have that good experience again. Right. Yeah. So it's brand like going out to eat one of my key food. words. Yeah. You know absolutely. Yeah. You go out and try new food. Like uh, you don't always get something new because you're afraid you won't like it. So sure. you always go to what you what you know. You know what I mean? It's exactly yeah. the yeah. same. One hundred percent. Uh, two, I wanted to ask you about Ryan while we had you was kind of the more, uh, I, I, I would assume, I know that, uh, a reel that you did here in the last few months to, uh, old AV alum, Micah, buddy of yours, you mm-hmm. guys had to do a little modification on a, uh, I, I guess it was a, a troll motor it looked like to me or some type mm-hmm. of motor that you had on your kayak. Uh, I know that you do like kayak mods and stuff like that and, and it's nothing that I really considered myself and actually being a thing, but my brother-in-law just kind of started getting into that himself as well. Um, can you kind of talk about that that game and what that looks like if people are trying to get actual um, motorized mechanisms for their kayaks and stuff like that? So electronics in general are super cool. Um, it's, a, it's a game changer for anybody that is taking fishing seriously. Um, Obviously, if you're just looking to be a recreational guy, you don't need a motor. You don't need a fish finder. You don't need fancy lights. You know, you just need a, a piece of plastic and, and some water. But for the guys that are, like, getting more serious into it, there's so many mods and so many types of ways to motorize a kayak anymore that, like, your your options are unlimited. And that's one place where so I'm, one of my sponsors is Eco Fishing Shop. They have everything you can imagine for putting electronics on a boat, including a regular trolling motor, like what would go on a bass boat down to the style of motor that you you're referring to. I put on my kayak, um, which is kind of a, a stern mounted trolling motor. Um, Torquedo and Newport both make a similar style motor. Um, they're, they're both great motors. Um, mine specifically is called Newport. Um, the difference is, I can put whatever battery I want to on my motor and a Torquedo, you have to use their, their batteries. Mm, so that, gotcha. that's really the difference between the two, ba- yeah. two types of motors there. Um, I, I love it. Um, everybody that I've ever known that looks at my oldest kayak, which is an old town topwater pedal drive kayak. Um, I have so many holes drilled in that, that some of them don't even have anything covering them anymore. Cause like they had something covering them at one point and I got rid of it and I was just like, ah, it'll be all right. And I just leave it open. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> and so I'm not afraid to just drill into kayaks and cut holes and modify it to the extremes. Um, I put uh boondocks landing gear on my old town, which a lot of people really hate because it, old towns aren't designed for them. Uh, I put a Newport motor on it. A lot of people hate because they're not designed for them. Old Town's not really a, a brand that's designed for you to do a lot of aftermarket stuff on. But 
I see that as the challenge. And I'm like, how do we make it work? Yeah. And, right. and people like to see that. People like to see how they can do that kind of off the wall stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and so for me, it's it's really just fun. Um, it's a challenge. And I would do it with no matter what kayak I had. I just happened to have an old town. Um, I got into old town back in 2018, I think is when I got my, my old town. Mm -hmm. And I, I've just, I've been in love with it ever since and couldn't imagine ever fishing out of another kayak. So that's just the kayak that I have that I do modifications to. And then I bought another old town since then. And I'll probably have another one um, in the near future. So that's um, awesome, man. Well, we yeah, should have I mean, one to play with and figure out what you, you know what I mean? So now if you keep buying them, you're like, I know how to do this now on this thing. Yeah. So like my pedal drive kayak, the cool thing is that you have the pedal drives right there in, in front of you, but then you have the electric motor behind you that if I want to spot hop, so if I'm out on, on a big lake and I want to just cruise like two miles, I don't have to wear myself out by pedaling or paddling right. two miles. I just turn the electric motor on and I play on Instagram for, you know, however long it takes me to go that far. Yeah. And then when I'm fishing, I can just use the pedals and I maintain a little bit more leverage over fish. If you're catching fish, um, it's quieter. So you, you have that advantage. Um, and then I have the second kayak, which is purely motorized. It's an old town Minn Kota 106 sportsman. So it just has a motor. There's no pedals, uh, but I can paddle it if I need to, obviously. Um, and that was a cool kayak that I bought. Um, wasn't exactly what I wanted whenever I bought it. I loved it. I fished the whole season out of it, but I ended up going back to the pedal drive because I, I loved that kayak. It was my first kayak. So I kept the Minn Kota actually left it in Ironton for like, if I ever have a trip where I go to Ironton and I just need a boat, I've got a second boat sitting there. So awesome. That um, works out. Yeah. <laughs> and then I'll probably end up in uh, what's called an old town, uh, autopilot. Um, so that's like the, the Lamborghini of kayaks right now. <laughs> it's got a, it's got a really nice trolling motor that drops down into the center of the kayak. It's got spot locks so that I can stay in one spot without doing anything. It's all hands free. I just hit a button on a remote and it just stays there. Man, oh, dang, you can't these are that. nice. I'm looking them up yeah. right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, this boy's going to end up buying a kayak before we even stop recording. <laughs> so um, it's, it's a ton of fun. Um, the, the cool thing is that with the – so, I'm like I said, I was connected with Eco Fishing Shop, but I'm also on the pro staff with Old Town Kayaks. So, yes, nice. I am biased, but I've been with them for five years. I've only been with Old Town as a staff member since um, this year. This is my first year with them. Okay. Um, so I am biased, but I've been with them for a long time that I, I know that they're just a great kayak. So um, I'm not just saying, oh, they're great because, you know, they sponsor me. Like I'm saying they're sure. great because I've been with them for a long time and I just happen to be sponsored by them now. Um, right. and, and so I've had the opportunity to be in every type of Old Town kayak that there is. I've been in Hobies, I've been in Natives, I've been in Jacksons, I've been in them all. Um, and, and Old Town is the best, plain and simple. Um, the Hobie people will will scoff at that because um, Hobies and Old Towns are really the top two. Um, and so everybody complains about which one's better. But Right. But it's, it's one intense. One of those divisive like, things. In yeah, the I mean, he world. just looked up the, the sportsman, <laughs> the autopilot. You know, it's like... Forty five hundred dollar kayak, something like that. Forty oh, yeah. I think is is the retail right now for it. Yeah, uh, and so I mean, you're dropping some pennies on it. You know, it's not. Yeah, you know, it's not jump change. Um, yeah, four where, three four nine. Yeah, where you can go yep. to uh, Walmart or Tractor Supply and get one for what three hundred bucks right now. Yeah, right. about three fifty yeah. four hundred. Yeah, yeah. Um, and so I've had the opportunity to be in all of these kayaks because you know my my connections. Um, it, but I also can get into a sun dolphin and float the Black River any day of the week and have a, have a good time. I'm not going to be as comfortable. Yeah. Don't get me wrong, but I can sure. do it. Right. Sure. Absolutely. Uh, one thing, let's say somebody's watching this show for the first time. They're kind of overwhelmed with some of the information that we've presented, but they do have an interest in getting and starting and kayak fishing in particular. 
what are some key essentials that you would say is a good starters pack for a beginner? You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be the highest of end products, but stuff that you feel like that you've had some experience with maybe, or experience adjacent, that this would be a good starter pack for somebody. Uh, so let's just go super basic then. So the first thing that anybody is looking at, into getting kayaks, uh, whether you're, um, you've been around water a lot, you need to get a, a, a life jacket, a PFD, plain and simple. I, I don't care how long you've been swimming. You don't know what's going to happen on that river. Um, maybe once you've had a few trips, you know, I'll say maybe you can relax a little bit, um, and not wear a PFD. Um, I, I, I cringe to say that because I wear a PFD every single trip, no matter where I'm going. There are times that I've forgotten it by pure accident and I've gone without it, but 99.9% .9 of the time, as long as I've been doing this, I mean, I was a, I was a lifeguard. I was a lifeguard instructor and I still wear a, a life jacket. Every time I go out, no matter what, um, you need to have a good life jacket on. Um, there's plenty of good ones out there, but you need to get a comfortable one. Uh, get right. one that's specifically for kayaks. They have high, high backs on them. So when you're sitting in your seat, it's not just wearing you out. So life jackets are the number one thing you got to think about. The second thing is most people that are getting into kayaks are probably going to get a, a paddle kayak because they don't want to drop the Cheapest you're going to get a pedal kayak is probably fourteen hundred bucks, um, and and that's a low end. Um, that's the cheapest pedal kayak I think you can get is probably around fourteen hundred bucks. Um, whereas, like we're saying, you can go get a lifetime for you know three fifty, four hundred bucks. So a lot of people are going to start there, which is great, great place to start. Pick one that's got a good seat in it, mm -hmm. and, and when I say get a good seat. Don't sit directly on the plastic of the kayak. Get one that's got kind of a metal rigid frame on the on where you're sitting and on your back. Because if you're out there for 30 minutes, it's going to wear you out. Like it yeah. like just trying to stand back up when you get out of it is going to hurt you. So therefore if you have an emergency situation in a kayak, like if you're not in something comfortable and your back is hurting, it's going to make it that much harder for you to one, recover the kayak or two, recover yourself. Yeah. So get a good quality kayak. That's going to have a, a good seat in it. And you don't have to pay a lot of money to get one. That's got a good seat in it. Plain and simple. You can go to Walmart. I'm sure and get one. that has got a decent seat. So, right. um, and then the other part of that is, is getting one that's actually built right. Um, and I, and I'll say this without a knock to Walmart, but a sun dolphin is not built right. Uh, right. They're very, they're very tippy. Um, yeah. They're, they are great for the person that wants to go float a river twice a year and they're just looking to just goof off. Right. But if, but if you're actually wanting to consider getting into it, the biggest mistake that I see people get is underspending. It, it's never been, been somebody saying, well, I overspent on a kayak. It's no, no, no. I over, I underspent on a kayak because I'm not comfortable. I'm tipping myself all the time. And, and then you just give up because you're frustrated with it. So you, you yeah. have to find that middle ground. And there's only one way to find the middle ground. It, there really is. And that's to go to a, a place that has kayaks that will let you demo them. Um, there's plenty of those across Missouri. Um, again, the one I'll repeat is Eco Fishing Shop out of Camdenton, up by Lake of the Ozarks. Mm -hmm. They have all all the kind of major brands that you would need to check out, um, along with some of the cheaper models that you can try that um, that actually have quality seats in them. Um, I'll, I'll say that's uh, Van Hunk's board, Van Hunk boards. I think is what they're called. Okay. Um, they're definitely a cheaper kayak, but they still have quality components to where you're not going to regret the underspin. So, right. um, but then, you know, you get there and just be, you can go to them and directly tell them, I'm going to buy a cheap kayak, but I still want to go check out the really nice one. And they'll say, all right, cool, let's go, man. And yeah. they'll go get you out in an autopilot unless you plan an autopilot. And then you can go buy a $500 kayak. Or whatever. Right. right. So, yeah. And again, that refer that, refers back to the community. Like they want to see people get into the sport. Definitely. Um, even if they don't buy a, a $5,000 kayak right then, there's nothing to say that they're not going to fall in love with that. You know, let's just say a thousand right. kayak, whatever they buy. 
And then a year from now, they come back and say, hey, that was so awesome. I had the best year of my life. I'm buying the Sportsman. Right. You know, Absolutely. or the Hobie 360, you know, and just, but it, it, you have to go and find that middle ground. And the only way you can do that is by actually doing it in person. It, and yeah. It, it really is. And, and that's inconvenient for a lot of people sure. because you say, like, let's look at Ironton. How far is it for you to get? to somebody that's actually going to have kayaks that you can try out. You know, you, what right. if you don't know somebody that has a nice kayak that you can try out? So it, right. can, it can be kind of hard for you to actually go out and do it. Right. Um, but the other side of that is, realistically, if, if you talk to a kayak retailer, most retailers these days have people like me on staff who are around you know, and whether they be like close to you all the time, or maybe they just pass through your area from time to time, we can just bring mm -hmm. a nice kayak and just be like, Hey, like, you know, they said you guys wanted to check out a kayak. So here's mine. Yeah. You know? Yeah. That's cool. That's nice. Yeah, it really is. And I'm sure that a lot of people haven't even considered that being a possibility as well. So yeah, you literally uh, just have I'm, to ask them, do you have a, a staff member that would be in my area? Demo. That I could try a right. Kayak? Yeah. 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 Yeah, and um, so, I guess as as far as the fishing piece of it too, uh, it would be kind of contingent on what type of fishing they want to do and that sort of thing. But I'm sure you've had some experiences with like, you know, tackle boxes and other fishing tools and gear that's a little bit more, we'll say, cumbersome to use whenever you're kayak fishing specifically. Yeah, I've had some pretty uh, cumbersome <laughs> sets of equipment. Um, I mean, I, I went all the way to, I had a, a rolling toolbox was my tackle box. Um, last year, actually, was what I used. It was a big uh, hard <laughs> tools rolling toolbox. It's like a 20, I think it's like a 28-inch box with slide-up tops and everything. Yeah. And it's so much. But then, like, when you start doing tournaments, it's like, well, what, what are the fish going to be biting? You know, I don't want to leave my good stuff at home. Right, right. And so you kind of see the journey of every fisherman go from they went out taking one box and two poles to I'm taking eight poles and every lure I've ever owned. And then they start to kind of shrink back down within about two years after that to where they say, OK, like, you know, I don't need all of this. You know, I kind of know what I'm doing. And right. Yeah. Kind of get that that middle ground. But it takes a while to to get it and to find it. Right. So. And a lot of people don't consider how much goes into selecting certain baits for certain situations or certain days or uh, late conditions or weather patterns or time of year. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, so there's oh, so yeah. much different stuff that goes into it. It's, it's, it's almost very trial extensive. And error. Yeah. 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 And, and even just your casual fisher person doesn't always realize that you want to use certain baits for certain types right. of fish that you're trying to catch too. Right. You know, like if you're just, again, just somebody that's real entry level and not, you know, ignorant to the sport or ignorant to the recreation. Right. It's, it takes people, a mentor, reading something, getting on YouTube. I like that you've mentioned several times that you went to YouTube for resources. Absolutely. Too because, I was yeah. To say like that. even people like our age, even though we've kind of grown up in the technology boom and we should be pretty like adept and aware of the resources at our fingertips, we often forget that this information is so readily accessible too. Right. You yeah. know, and Which we don't think the crazy of thing is, is, so YouTube is a huge resource, but I think it was actually last year, Instagram became like the number one, uh, search engine on the internet over YouTube and everything, because it's easier to go on and find that the small amount of information to consume versus going right. to find YouTube or it's going to give you the information, but it's going to take you a half an hour to find the information right, right. you're looking for. Whereas Instagram is going to give you that short form stuff um, where you learn it in 30 seconds. And then you right. say, oh, okay, maybe I do need the, the long form video of it. But you've got that quick amount of consumption to know like the basic part of it. So, right. Um, yeah. But that's the nice thing about social media is that it's, it's opened those avenues for people to want to learn faster. And it's giving you access to the, to people who are willing to teach you, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And I, and I would assume that, you know, let's say one of our listeners too 
today were intrigued by our conversation. If they would hit you up via DM, you'd give them some sound advice as well. Yeah. I, so I talk to people. You know, it's probably almost every day I'm getting messages from people that, you know, whether they just want to know about the kayak, whether they want to know about fishing, hey, I'm traveling to this area, this is what we're looking at, kind of what do you think the fish are going to be doing? And, you know, I love to help people. And I was just having a conversation today with uh, with my buddy Jake um, about kind of that, that community aspect of I'll tell anybody any information they want. I'll be in the middle of a fishing tournament and I've given my, my bait away to a guy that's like, dude, I can't catch any fish. I'm like, here, this one's catching fish. And I'll just cut it off my line and put it in his boat. And I'm like, it, it's more important for me to see the sport grow and for people to enjoy it. than it is for me to be like, Oh, I kicked your ass. Like I caught, you know, whatever amount of fish yeah. that day. Like, I don't, I don't care about that. I really don't. Um, yeah. I've done live streams during tournaments before where I'll, I'll just sit there and talk to people about kind of what I'm doing, what my process is, because it, it's, it's more for me to, to spread the education and, and what little amount of information I have, you know, I don't know it all by any means, you know, I'm not a pro, but you know, I, I know more than a lot of people. So I'll, I'll sure. share any information I have with anybody and I'll let anybody in my kayak. I've never told somebody they can't get in my kayak. I've let stra complete strangers at the boat ramp get in my kayak. Well, you're nicer than I am. Yeah. It's like getting the hell out of my kayak. You know yeah. how much does kayak cost? What's wrong with you? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. So, <laughs> uh, I, uh, Josh and I actually have a mutual friend who – it was very out of character for him, though. It's just kind of a sunny, funny sidebar. Uh, he all of a sudden got a – he wanted to get a sit-on-top kayak for whatever reason. He was like, I'm going to go fishing with this guy. Never been in a kayak in his life. Nothing. Took it out to St. Joe Lake, of all places, to drop in with the kayak. Lost his brand new kayak the first day. Sunk he got out, <laughs> sunk it, couldn't find it. Yeah, just lost it almost oh, immediately. Wow. Yeah. So I That's was like, uh, yeah, yeah, I was like, have you ever kayaked before? No. Well, did you? <laughs> I don't know why you thought that was a good idea. Like I would have taken it to like a shallow river or a creek, right? Or something like a creek started, with a, yeah, right. Yeah, you know, a creek rather or something. than take it out on St. Joe Lake and uh, sink it in the middle. Yeah. <laughs> you're either going to sink it in the middle or you're going to end up with E. coli hanging out out there. Oh, yeah. Oh, man. <laughs> we don't swim out there. Yeah, that's, for that's sure. a no. spot for sure. Uh, Ryan, I wanted to ask you some random questions so our audience would uh, kind of get to know you a little bit better, uh, too, yeah. before we let you off. And I appreciate the time that you've taken with us. I know it's kind of hard, long drive today and uh, yeah, I'm sure you're ready getting ready for, for a tournament for tomorrow a and all that fun <laughs> stuff. So I'm just going to quick hit you with some. Uh, what, what would you say is a favorite TV show for you? The Office. All right. Hands down. Nothing wrong with Anybody that. that knows me, it's The Office. Awesome. Yes. repeat. That's a good answer. Hell yeah. That's got a lot of rewatchability. That's, <laughs> that stood the test <laughs> of time, man, for sure. Uh, what is the most underrated topping for pizza? Controversial. Controversial. Ooh. So, uh, mushrooms? Yes. Oh. I, I, I can't disagree with that. Um, I, would, I would go more divisive with my choice, and I would say pineapple. Because uh, a lot of people say pineapple don't yeah. go on pizza, but I both name both tell you the two things that I will not eat on pizza. <laughs> yeah. So I'm the snob, I guess. I'll tell you what. Actually, like one of the first times I ever had homemade pizza made for me was your mom made. Um, it was kind of like a deluxe style pizza, you know. It had like hamburger on it and stuff. I um, thought a joke I was coming. It. No, 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 no. Seriously, this is legit. Seriously, this is a legit story. Uh, and uh, I think she put hamburger on it, and I was just like, I don't do hamburger on my pizza. And at first I was – but I didn't want to hurt her feelings, and I tried it, and I loved it. You were like, yes. <laughs> yeah. And then I was like, all right, man, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have pizza every time that they're having pizza now. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, as far as your personal idols, people that inspire you, who would you kind of place on that Mount Rushmore? And if you can't keep it to just four people, you're welcome to throw in a uh, – an honorable mention if you'd like, but it doesn't necessarily have to be in the fishing world, just people that you draw inspiration from. Uh, so really, so my biggest, I guess, inspiration um, ever since, you know, I was finishing up my time in the military was John Wooden. Um, a lot of people don't know who John Wooden is. Uh, UCLA, um, great legend of coaching. He's inspired just, I couldn't even guess how many people he's inspired in his time. Um, just the way that he impacted the sports world and the people yeah. outside of it, just in being a good human being, like that, that guy 
changed my life without a doubt. Yeah. Um, and he was dead before he's I impact a lot of people. started reading his books, you know? Yeah. <laughs> um, he's just that great of an individual. Um, on the fishing world, uh, let's talk about Gerald Swindle. That guy is, oh, yeah. uh, is a hammer. Uh, Duke can catch fish no matter what, but he's also just this super awesome personality who is funny, but he gets real with you and he cares a lot about people. So I love to see that kind of stuff. Um, I'll, I'll go Mopey for a second. I'll say my dad. Um, I love my dad as much as, um, as much as a man can love another man. Um, you know, for people that don't know, my dad adopted my brother and I, and the, the stuff that it takes for a man to do that is just beyond words. And he has just always yeah. been there to support us. Um, and so like, I've just got so much respect for him as a man that Mike's the man for sure. Yeah. Uh, like Love I just guy. try to learn from him all the time and I'm like, man, I just teach me. And he's like, Oh, you're teaching me how to be a dad. And I'm like, I'm not doing that. What are you talking about? <laughs> so he, he's just one of those people. He's just great. Um, and then the other person is actually my, my fishing buddy that I was talking about, Brandon Heinrichs. Um, he's another guy that's just taught me to just love people. Um, every day that guy's just, he loves people. It doesn't matter what they are or what they do to him. He just chooses to love people. And that's just kind of been a way that I've um, been trying to leave, live, leave my life. And, you know, he's one of those people. And that's why I think him and I have been so close for, for the years that we've known each other. It's just because, you know, he's just that kind of good person. That's awesome, man. Uh, this this one I'm intrigued to hear from you because I, I noticed you use a lot of various types of music in your reels and stuff, which I enjoy because I have a eclectic taste myself. But uh, what would you say is an es essential tracks for your fishing trip playlist? What are some songs that they're, you're definitely going to see on Ryan <laughs> Reed's playlist on the fishing trip? So wild. And, and people don't get it sometimes. But so I love some Jason Aldean. Uh, pretty much okay. any of his stuff just kind of hits for me because it's just like, really hammers with like country rock. So like, that's super cool for me. Um, but I like to turn on some jazz music when I'm, I'm fishing. Um, give me some like Michael Buble, some like oh, moon yeah. dance. Like I can jam on the water to some moon dance. <laughs> okay. So like, that's, that's awesome. like a blast for me, but then I'll turn on some like five finger death punch and just hardcore screamo stuff. And yeah. But like I have to have a mix, man. I can't I can't yeah. settle into like a genre for an extended period of time because it'll just kind of lull me into boredom. Yeah. And so sure. like I need to get like all over the place. I need it to be like some country rock, um, to like some some screaming to Michael Bublé on a saxophone, you know, jamming. Yeah. Oh, hell yeah. Yeah. Nothing wrong with that. Nope, not not at all. And uh, <laughs> variety is always a good thing. I have a river playlist that I've created slash party playlist that we play every time we go to the river, and I put it on random. I mean, we'll never be able to get through all of the songs. I have so many songs on there, but it's got everything from Three Six Mafia to Tom Petty. Oh on yeah, there. I mean, it's just got quite, <laughs> quite the uh, collective oh, mix yeah. of music. No, so yeah, no. It, I, I, I like the grills is coming back. I've, I've yeah. heard that song a lot lately, which is funny uh, to me. Uh, I, I have not, but uh, I can see it because there's been a few like mid two thousands rap songs and stuff I've started to notice. Yeah, well, Nelly, even, come back. Nelly's been Nelly's really a popular bit, yeah. locally on the radio lately. Yeah. yeah, yeah, for sure. Well, Ryan, hey man, you've been so generous with your time. I appreciate you taking the time out to do the show. Absolutely. And as you can hear, the lovely or may not be able to hear the lovely train in the background. I live right next to the the train track here. <laughs> The uh, clock train. Yeah, the the Biel, the Bielman truck trucking company is uh, basically in my backyard. So there's that. Uh, <laughs> it adds a little uh, mood to the to the setting of the podcast at times. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, I man, I appreciate it, and I hopefully we can touch base with you again yeah, down the road. Yeah, thanks for coming and, on. And uh, yeah, your man. insight yeah. was extremely valuable, and and appreciate being able to explore a different part of the outdoors that we haven't explored at all yet on the podcast. Too. Let's all go fishing sometime. Yeah, yeah. man. Happy to, <laughs> happy to jump on here with you guys. And like I said, if, uh, if anybody's listening or even you guys, you know, hit me up and, you know, if I'm ever around it, uh, you know, I can take you guys fishing. I got two kayaks every time I go to Missouri for the most part. So 
Heck yeah. I'm I'm one hundred percent down with the kayaking, the fishing I might just watch though. So. <laughs> <laughs> I'll live vicariously through your guys' fishing. It's all right. <laughs> this is Barrett from the ATI podcast. Each week, Josh and I discuss current events, pop culture, music, TV, movies, politics, sports. Nothing is out of bounds. You can also tune in to learn about rising artists, small businesses, whether it's music, graphic design, filmmaking, or even a brick-and-mortar mom-and-pop shop. We will be spotlighting folks and their endeavors. Listen to us on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, Anchor, or anywhere you enjoy your podcasts. Just search ATI Podcast. We would like to thank you for your continued support. And as always, please stay safe out there. Hey, this is Josh from ATI Podcast. For show updates and news about the podcast, follow us on social media. You can follow us on Facebook at facebook.com slash ATI Podcast 22, on Twitter at podcast underscore ATI, on Instagram at the ATI Podcast, on TikTok at ATI Podcast. DMs are always welcome. Have a question for the show? You can always email us at ATI Podcast Questions at gmail.com. Stay safe out there.